Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, this is uh, part of my role is actually a part of traveling and speaking at international conferences and, impro and improving my English language skills is uh, talking to developers and uh, learning from them how they use GitLab. And one thing I have noticed that although a lot of people are using GitLab, they not, don't really use GitLab CI. So this is why first talk is educational and I hope you will learn something new about GitLab CI. So, but let's first talk about uh, about continuous integration itself. Continuous integration uh, has actually two aspects. If, we, if you're going to talk about it, first aspect is uh, uh, motivational. Like, let's actually, uh, let's prevent in integration problems, right? And let's actually uh, combine all working pieces together at least once a day to check if our product actually, actually works. That's like, like it was before. And, but for now, I feel like there's no need actually to convince anyone anymore to use CI. I feel like it's more like version control today, like whether, whether you're already using it or you want to use it. So, and the thing is that, that the second part of continuous integration is practical part. And in the early days, continuous integration used to be manual. Like the whole uh, team got together and had to combine all those pieces together and manually check if everything worked. Then um, new then products start to appear, which uh, were automating continuous integration. But still, there was a need for a separate role in the team to, com com to configure and, and to support CI uh, tool. But today, it's not already like this, and modern CI tools are like can be used by any developer, and they don't require so much time to learn and to use. Um, and therefore, I think that CI uh, CI can be used not only for big projects today, but also for small projects, like personal one, and for any projects actually. So, and when it comes to actually learning new CI tool. Uh, there were four fears. I detected those fears by myself when I started to, to explore GitLab CI. And the first fear is the installation. Like, it sounds like you had to spend maybe a day to install the, the CI tool. Then you need to configure it and to integrate uh, with the rest of your tools, like with the code hosting solution or some, and some other tools. Uh, then you need to convince all of your colleagues to register in, the, in this new tool, to set up permissions, uh, so it would reflect the structure of your company. And the final thing here is that you need to actually learn how to configure it so it will run the stuff you want to run, whether it's tests, deployment, or build, uh, packages build, building. So GitLab, uh, has CI already for one year, uh, and let's take a look how those peers apply to GitLab CI. So first of all, there's no need to install GitLab CI if you already installed GitLab, right? There's no need to integrate, it's already integrated. There's no need to convince, uh, to convince your colleagues to register there. And the only thing that, which is there is that you need to learn how to use it. So, and from, from here, I'm going to tell you one story, and hopefully you will learn how to use GitLab CI if you haven't yet. So, our story starts uh, in a cat grab sophisticated technologies incorporated, and you just got a job in this company, and this company has a product, software product, mm -hmm. and this product consists of two files, file one and file two. And, yeah. And there is a, and the code is already hosted on GitLab.com, but there is one super strict rule that concatenation result of these two files should contain hello world. And if it's not there, then the whole uh, software development team stays without, without a salary for a month. 
So it's that strict, yeah. And you kind of not satisfied with this situation, and you decided uh, uh, that it, it's not really good. And you, first of all, you decided, you wrote the test script, of course, and you got a bonus, and you got a promotion, and everyone in the team agreed that they will execute this the script before pushing code to master. And uh, but later uh, you actually decided to utilize GitHub CI and first thing you will do, you will go to Google and you will realize that the only thing you need to do to start using GitLab CI is to create this file, gitlabci.yaml. And uh, what's happening here? So first of all you need to name the job the name is secure test, and you need to be just putting your script there uh, using keyboard script. Then, uh, when we push this file to GitLab, it detects uh, that uh, that we want CI to be launched, and we see that uh, build passes or fails depending on the contain uh, or on what's in your files. Okay, you just if you have uh, some script. For deployment or to run your tests, you can actually already use GitLab CI. You can just put uh, this script execution there and it will work. But there is, of course, another requirement like, does customer wants us to package our uh, code before sending it, it to, uh, to him? And we're going to create Z package using GitLab CI. So, since you already know how to how to use uh, how to create jobs for GitLab CI, we create just another one. We name it package. We put another script where which creates package and and we see it now two tabs and we can switch between them and see the results. But we need to make the result downloadable. And to do this, we specify we use another keyword called artifacts. And we specify the paths we need to make, uh, we want to make downloadable. GitLab detects it and, and gives us the link to download the mock browse. Okay. So here's our script, and but here's the problem actually, because now even if test will fail, the package job will run because right now they run uh, in parallel. So what we need to do, we need to uh, make the run in sequence. And to do so, uh, we need to use stages keyword and specify an order there and to put stage keyword in each job. Mm. That's it, it will work. So, uh, and But we just detected another problem. We detected that our builds are slow. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to Explore what's happening actually, and uh, here it is. So, uh, yeah, we actually have an application here. Of course, concatenation will be executed like almost immediately, but in real life, it could be some kind of compilation here, and you don't want to execute compilation twice. So, we can move it to different stage. And we create uh, another job compile, we create another stage compile, we specify artifacts, and uh, here we use artifacts to pass the uh, file between stages. And another problem is that we're actually using the Ruby 2.1 Docker image for some reason, but we, we've never asked for it. And the trick here is that uh, it comes from the GitLab installation defaults, and by default, uh, GitLab.com uh, uses Ruby 2.1 image. So we need to learn what image to use here. And actually, you can use any Docker image. You can create your own and you can even host it on GitLab.com. And uh, but if you will look for really compact, compact image, you will quickly find image called Alpine. It is Linux distributed. And all you need to do is to specify this keyword image alpine and and the uh, time execution drops from three and a half minutes to 35 seconds with only this small change. So uh, the next 
The next requirement is that one of the customers asked us to send him ISO image in, instead of the zip archive. So now we we could like create another job, another stage for it, and do everything in in sequence. But it doesn't make sense. We could uh, execute those two. Uh, we could kind of generate those two packages in parallel, right? Because they're not depending one on another. So here's the script. First, we install the package. We and the second command is actually generating this ISO image. And here's how the script looks like. So now we have uh, created two jobs, pack uh, GZ and pack ISO, but the stage is the same for them, and it means that they will be executed in parallel during this package stage execution. So now we created the pipeline. And whenever you push changes to, to a repository, like a compile job will be executed, then it goes to test, and then two jobs are running in parallel, and the, and the results go to Artifacts. So, yeah, we created three stages and four jobs. We know how to pass files between stages. We uh, know how to make Artifacts downloadable. We optimized the execution time, and we built one custom pipeline. Another requirement, uh, someone realized that we don't actually need to send our packages manually. We can just create a small website and publish them there, right? So we decided to publish them on S3, on Amazon S3, and, uh, and we are using this command. It comes from Amazon command line library. And when you execute it from your laptop, it actually looks like this. So you first, you can, those are separate commands. Like you're pushing your stuff to GitLab, uh, to GitLab and you're pushing your, you deploying your stuff to Amazon S3 using another command. But we want it to look more like this. So we will be pushing everything to GitLab and we want it to deploy all this stuff for us. So let's do it. And first of all, Amazon command line library uh, can be installed using pip, and pip goes together with Python. So we can just use uh, Docker image Python. Uh, we create another stage called deploy, and we put our script there. And another requirement, which is here, is that we need to provide these two uh, environment variables in order to this, to this command to be executed, because those are Amazon secret keys. We can do it like this. You can just specify them right in the configuration using variables uh, keyword. But it's not a good idea to put your secret keys in, in configuration files, even if it's a private project. So there is a proper place for stuff like this. There is a, a section called variables in the GitLab settings. And you can put every, every secret case there, and they will be turned into environment variables during the job execution. So uh, the configuration is, is again small, and we push it, and it, again, it, it works. So the next thing is that uh, another de de developer appeared on the project, and now you don't already develop on master. You started to use feature branches. But with existing configuration, it will deploy everything in a, despite the uh, you can use on any on any branch. You will, uh, come on. for example, you uh, push your stuff to a develop branch, and it will be deployed anyway. So we don't want it. So we, we want our stuff to be deployed only if we push to master. So we use only keyword and specify the branch there. Okay. Now the picture looks like this. So only stuff which is go to master goes to S3. Great. Now developers have asked for another place for, to test their branches. And we decided to utilize GitLab pages uh, since it's already there. And with GitLab pages, you can host any static website. Uh, and there are three requirements you need to satisfy in order to get your stuff hosted on GitLab pages. First of all, you need to name your job um, pages. You need to put 
you, you need to make sure that everything you want to host is located in the folder called public, and you need to specify artifact section with this public folder. And your stuff will be hosted in the, uh, on the URL like this. So that's a really simple script, and you all should already understand every single line here. So we the stage is deploy, image of find, script is really simple, artifacts, and we specify it to work uh, only for branches, for, for all branches except master. So here's the full configuration, and here's the picture. Here's the picture, and uh, you might have noticed that we have now three destination systems, and most of you would call this S3 team a production environment, and this GitLab page is a staging environment. And you will be right, and GitLab actually has support for environments, and we can simply, what we can do, we can specify environment for every job, and uh, like this, yeah. And after you do it, GitLab will start recording all the uh, all the deployments like you will you will see what branch is deployment on which uh, environment and you will also get a history of deployment of uh, every environment and you can even roll back the deployment using this button okay here's how it looks like almost the same but now we have a labels for our destination systems and now we have a history for our deployment and the final final requirement, uh, our project managers gently ask us not to mess up the production because now we have even more developers, and sometimes they have merged conflicts, and sometimes since we have automated deployment, they go to straight to production. So we can, what we can do here, we can just uh, turn off automatic deployment and make it the manual procedure. So. It can be done with the keyword when and the value manual. And if you do it, you will get uh, your job will get the status skipped and you will get this uh, play button there. So you can manually click on it and only then the deployment will be triggered. So you have just learned how to actually use GitLab CI. And I think you can even put this on your resume now. <laughs> because it's really simple and it's really powerful. And it's going to be even more powerful. I think Kyoko will later tell you more about it. So yeah, you just overcome this here. And it looks like you... It's not really scary to use GitLab CI anymore. So uh, that's it. And those are my, my contacts. If you have any questions, you can ask them right now or later. And uh, those two links, if you have a colleagues who are not using GitLab CI yet, send those links to them. And those are actually two articles uh, with almost the same content, but a little bit different. So they could learn uh, about GitLab CI as well. So does anyone have any questions? If not, we can go to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.